BioBalance HealthCast, episode 268, Medical Treatments for Insomnia. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Today we're going to be talking about sleep problems, and this is the second of two health casts that we did. Last time we did one uh, on people that have sleep problems that are caused, the focal point of concern for causation is more stress and depression and embarrassment, uh, the psychological, emotional issues. And at the end of that conversation, we realized that there's more that needs to be said than we had time in that segment for that has to do with physiological causation. Now, a lot of time they're intertwined, and you have to just pick Mm -hmm. a a target and unwind it from one end of the string or the other, but both ends matter. Uh, But sometimes they're not intertwined so much. Your life can be emotionally in a very comfortable place for you, and you can still have difficulty either going to sleep or staying asleep that will cause you some concern. And so what we're going to talk about today are the medical physiological causations for that and the treatments that are recommended for Mm -hmm. that. So if you have difficulties falling asleep or staying asleep, uh, listen to these two podcasts. Go back and check the other one. Listen to this one and see if you get information that will then be useful to help you attack and solve your difficulties with sleeping. Because you... You've got to have, we physiologically need to live healthy lives and, and uh, functional lives, mm-hmm. need the ability to sleep. A third of and our sleep life restful. should be spent sleeping mm-hmm. eight hours a night. And really, that's ideal. People who don't sleep eight hours a night actually have been tested and found to have a shorter lifespan and a longer sick span. So then they may is, die from some other thing. Right. Like, like Lyndon Johnson. Well, <laughs> Spent most of his adult life sleeping four hours or less a night, and you but may he die. died from a heart attack. Right, but and, and, who this, knows? and it's smoking, not about and, sleep. You know. Lack of sleep causes you to die early. It's lack of sleep causes physiologic problems, which then cause you to age more right. rapidly right. and cause you to have malfunctions in that machine that's your body. It's like having shorts in your a short in your system, like electrical short or mm-hmm. something wrong with your plumbing. I mean, if you look at a, a body like a house, you know, like it's, it's very... Like plugged in. Yes, yeah. that's right. And then, then it is something that <laughs> that is going to... Uh, actually cause downstream problems. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk today about the illnesses or the diagnoses that I make on an everyday basis with patients. And the, and the way I go about this is a way that you can go about looking at your own symptoms. So one of the things I, I ask first is that if we have a, a questionnaire that says, do you have insomnia? Mm -hmm when we're looking at low testosterone and low estrogen. So insomnia is different for everyone. People usually write in, I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep or I wake up all night. So in in terms of aging, the Which first kind of a hormone, trick question for you because you already know the answer. Well, no, I do it on I mean, purpose because I I'd like to know what when I first meet a patient, that's one of the symptoms of low testosterone. It's the first hormone that goes away. Mm-hmm. It's the first hormone that causes late in our late 30s and early 40s for women and a little later for men, usually the problem of not being able to stay asleep. Yes. So I ask, okay, so you have you have trouble sleeping. Do you fall asleep well? Oh yeah, I'm exa- usually testosterone, low testosterone patients or aging patients mm-hmm. will say I fall, I fall asleep just like that, and then I wake up and I worry, or I wake up and I'm hot, or I wake up, and that's from low estrogen, mm-hmm. or I wake up and just can't go back to sleep no matter what I do, and that's a big problem because then that, we try the behavioral things, and that doesn't work usually. Right. In this case, it is a supply of hormones and the lack of it. Yeah, your car could be really well-tuned, but it isn't going to run without gas. That's right. You need to have your testosterone replaced so you can sleep, so that you can be well, so that you can live a long, healthy life. So it's one of the many symptoms of low testosterone, and it does impact your future health. So that's, that's what it tells me 
the testosterone's low and or estrogen's low. Men wake up with anxiety attacks at night when their testosterone's low. Women wake up with hot flashes when their estrogen's low. Women usually don't wake up with hot fla- with excuse me with uh, anxiety attacks. They wake up hot and sweaty. So so I want to go back to what I said because I I meant it in a better way than you heard. Okay. Uh, I often it's kind of a trick you. question for you because what Kathy does, what what she knows, and what we preach in all these podcasts and in our book, The Secret Female Hormone, is that as you age, your hormone production will decline. And as a result of that decline, you're going to have symptoms of illnesses and diseases that come into your life that you wouldn't have if you had the healthy amount or the adequate normal amount of those hormones. So she knows when people come in, they're of an age where that's likely to be the problem. And what she's trying to find out is which hormone or which combinations of hormones are out of balance from the symptomology that you describe. And sleep difficulties can be from low estrogen or low testosterone. And, and what also, you're describing... High cortisol. High cortisol. So that's that other group of people uh-huh. who have high cortisol. They can't fall asleep. So so, so our, the decision matrix is beginning to form as you get information about symptoms. That's what a history is for. That's what your doctor should be thinking about when they're asking you questions. It should be... They're thinking about what could possibly be wrong with you, and they've already thought this out before they start asking the questions. Right. When I have people come to me, I try to save them time and money by not bringing them in until I've seen their lab and seen their history and all their symptoms. Then I've already got kind of clues. So then if I can help them, then I bring them in. If they so have no symptoms, you, you then don't I, don't, treat everybody I don't treat just everybody. Give them, here, take because this. That's not the answer. If you can't sleep and your testosterone is normal, then there is something else wrong. And so then we have to walk along that path, or and that's usually the primary care doctor's path, mm-hmm. or the psychiatrist's path, because psychiatrists look at ADD. ADD patients often cannot stay asleep, sometimes can't even go to sleep, because They have not been given enough norepinephrine during the day for their neurotransmitters to work properly. And so they're staying on this. It's kind of like idling your car all the time, but never driving it. You're idling all the time. You never drive it or turn it off. It's idling. So that's what ADDers feel like. They can't really go to sleep. They can't relax. But when you give them, believe it or not, when you give them some kind of Adderall or, or some kind of what we call stimulants, with an ADD, they're wired backwards, and that calms them down during the day and then allows them to sleep at night. That's amazing. It is an amazing way of of managing insomnia due to hyperactivity. And, you know, I have hyperactivity, so my, my feet are always, I mean, I'm always moving. And that's a problem. I have to control it. But I control it with medication. I also control it with behavioral change. Compensatory strategies. But compensatory strategies. So if I don't take my medication for this that I've taken since I was in my late 30s, then I don't sleep at night either. So I'm well aware of this. We both know this. I have a son who's pretty severely ADD, and when he doesn't take his medicine, he's uh, almost like he has echolalia. He makes funny noises Mm -hmm. randomly. They just come out of him. And he's like on a Saturday or Sunday, he often doesn't take his medicine. And because it affects his appetite and his mm-hmm. ability. So so he's making these weird noises. I'm like, Spencer, did you take your medicine today? <laughs> like, How'd you know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when yeah. I'm like fidgeting. He's all over the place. Yeah. Then yeah. that's obviously a sign that the ADD should be treated. Yes. If you can't, honestly, if you can't attend to things so that you can do your job, that you can stay on task, that you can sleep. If the issue with sleep is you can't go to sleep and you can't stay asleep, it may very well be ADD or ADHD. Well, you you were explaining to me before we sat down to the podcast about we've been to a convention a month or so ago, and Kathy was saying she had a bunch of notes and memos that she put in a folder somewhere, (laughs) and now they're lost in a sea of paper somewhere in her (laughs) office or her home. And she was saying, I need to learn to use my cell phone to take a picture of the notes that matter because that's always with me and I can find it. Mm-hmm. That's what we call a compensatory adaptation or compensatory strategy for helping. Because people always hand you these little sticky yeah, here, notes. Here, this call. is my information. Yeah. And I'm like, 
Yeah, ah, where, where can I put that? Yeah, where can I put that and how will I find it? And usually... So if you were at the convention and you gave her your phone number, it might be beneficial <laughs> if you'd call her. <laughs> call my office and leave the number again if you haven't heard from me. Yeah. But uh, in any in any case, yeah. Sorry. This, is, this is one of those can't fall asleep, can't stay asleep. Now, people who have had shift work in their lives. So so your life does does impact your illness and you work days here and nights here and oftentimes that causes you to have very high cortisols at night. Your clock is off. I used to work a job where I changed shifts once a month. We do day mornings. That's better for than a every month. other day. We do afternoons for a month and we do midnights for a month mm-hmm. and we go back to mornings. And every month we'd rotate. Mm-hmm. And what that does is it gets your cortisol. Your cortisol should be highest at 8 a.m. It should be lowest at 3 a.m. Okay, but mm-hmm. it it does a it goes up it's at 8 a.m. and it starts coming down. It has a little up in the evening and then drops to 3 a.m. and then comes drastically back up as you're waking up. Is that the same thing that we call jet lag? Well, jet lag impacts your circadian rhythm and impacts your cortisol. So in t- if you if you want to look at jet lag, then I tell people to take melatonin, and I this is anywhere, if, even if you're not jet lagged, when you have to go to sleep, your melatonin's off balance. So take melatonin when you it is time to go to sleep, or if you're in a jet and you're going one way or the other, east or west, then you should set your watch for the time that you are going, to, where you're going to arrive. So it's going to be set seven hours later in Italy. So I'm going to, I'm going to before you leave, right, right as you're leaving, you set your watch there, and when it is your bedtime, you put your eye eye goggles on and you take your melatonin, and if some people take a sleeping pill, so that they won't have jet lag. And then you take melatonin for the first week that you're in this new time zone. Then you don't have all that lost time feeling terrible and not being able to adjust. So you just pulled us into a new aspect of the conversation, the medicines no, you that did. you can take. <laughs> so you were talking about okay. hormones and replacing yes. hormones. Right. And, and Well, melatonin is a hormone, but you can take it orally. But, but then there are sleeping pills. Like, and then there's sleeping pills, which are chemicals that actually make you make everything calm down. They don't fix your hormones. They don't fix they don't fix your melatonin. They don't fix anything. They just make you go to sleep. So they're really not treating your problem. They're treating your symptom. And I really always like to get to the problem. Mm-hmm. So if you can't go to sleep, you probably have a cortisol problem. And I can follow that and prove it by doing uh, salivary tests four times in one day, and it'll show me when it's high and when it's right. low. And then I can suppress the uh, cortisol when it is peaking and should be low. And we use uh, animal cord- animal adrenal, and we give a small amount of that, and that calms the cortisol down uh, at bedtime. We usually give it at e- in the evening or late afternoon. Like the cross-wired ADD. It, right. It resets your it's a clock. stimulant, but that relaxes. Right. So we use that to decrease the surge of cortisol as you're trying to go to sleep because it wakes you up. It takes months to get this into uh, back into the right. Especially if you've lived your whole life out of out of chemical balance. Right, and and I never had a clock, and I never had a bedtime routine because my bedtime routine was running to the hospital and somebody waking me up with a phone call maybe fifteen times in a night. There is no way to have a normal cortisol and or a normal. Um, melatonin and a normal sleep cycle. So what you'll see with doctors is, and you'll always ask yourself, why is that doctor so fat and swollen? Well, that's our cortisol that is so elevated because they're trying to take care of people 24-7. Right. And that's what you'll see with doctors. And it's honestly just a side effect of their job. Mm-hmm. And it could be a side effect of like, like nurses in labor and delivery. Like Oftentimes they're swollen. Donuts and cops. Yeah, it, that, you know, I understand the theory, but that's not exactly, we're not, you're not eating yourself into this. You're actually just, your body's doing this to yes. survive. Yes. And it's it's a survival mechanism, but it makes you sick in many other ways. But it's an important point. It's not, you're, you're not eating yourself into this. It, you're not, it's not your fault. You're not abusing your body in some way externally. It just happens because of all the chemical changes that go on inside, mm-hmm. which is the physiological aspect of inability to sleep. Right. And my method is... 
find out which what you have, what your problem right. is, replace the hormones that are missing because you're aging or missing because you've abused your body or missing because you're wired backwards and have ADD. Replace what is missing or what is too high, suppress it. Mm -hmm. Get you into a normal completely normal hormonal or environment and chemical environment see what what's still there what is still there sometimes can be it can be your lifestyle that you haven't admitted i mean can be your your stress or your personality or your right. type a right. um, or it can be something else that is a I mean, people have brain tumors that keep them from sleeping. I brain mean, tumors, narcolepsy, narcolepsy, which restless is restless leg. Narcolepsy and ADHD are right next to each other um, genetically and have some have crossover. some crossover. Mm -hmm. So many people who had a mother who had narcolepsy, like I did, have ADHD. Interesting. So you, if you, I've never heard that. If connection. you have an ADHD parent and you're falling asleep while you're driving, or you're falling asleep. Lots of women come in and say, well, I sit down to watch TV and I'm out. Or their husbands complain that they're out. The minute they sit down and stop moving, they go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Or the worst narcolepsy is where you are talking to someone and you go, I mean, my, my, my mother had that. Yeah. And she, it, it damaged her relationships with people. Because then she'd she'd wake up and she'd kind of snored and kind of you know as she woke up she didn't know she'd been asleep but she'd missed so everything. So the message I get is I'm boring you, right? Or you don't care right. about me, right? But it's a chemical imbalance, yes. usually a, a loss of a neurotransmitter norepinephrine. So that's why we give what we call uppers or or uh, amphetamines. We that increases your norepinephrine for people who have narcolepsy and people who have ADHD. Mm -hmm. So that's the proper treatment for it. It's not something terrible. It's something you're born with, obviously. It's genetic. And we can help that and fix it. But I still think you need to have optimal hormones so that you don't need such a high level of medication right. to, to fix this problem. But I look at that when I ask that question when people are talking to me about narcolepsy did you have adhd or narcolepsy in your family and then we usually track it back to some place in the family wow. that they had an aunt or a parent who had one or the other and then that's easier for me to treat i've got it i've got a a something to go after and then course, watch you, them get if better your patient is the adult child of an alcoholic they are unlikely to know because alcoholic families t typically don't have that information spread among the family I don't they know don't pay what, attention you mean they don't see their mother falling asleep during a conversation? They may not, because you're trained as a child in that environment not to see what you see, not to know what you know, not to feel what you feel. This is normal. Then you need and to find you your non-alcoholic family members to yeah. tell you what's going on. No, I, well... If, and that's the only... If there is anybody. If there is anybody. Then you need to know... You know, family history is very important, and it will be important until we can do a complete genetic workup on every human being. And that's coming. And know exactly what your genes are, after that, family history is not going to be important because we know what you are. Right. We don't care about what your parents are. If you got the good gene from both parents, and you're not going to get the disease they had with the, with the bad genes. So right. we will be able to track this. This has not happened yet, but every time I read the Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, every time I read it, there's more genetic this locus and this and this is close to this and it's no longer hormones it's the gen genetics that cause you to have the hormones and the hormone hormonal makeup that you have when you're young as you age things change but and the way we age is also genetic right. so we'll be able to find that out but for now we need to know family history mm -hmm. and you should be armed with that when you go in to see your doctor about sleep one of the things i didn't discuss and many people have already been evaluated for it, is, is uh, sleep apnea. Mm. And in general, sleep apnea patients are larger or obese. They have very large necks. They are in short necks. So that when they lie back, a lot of pressure is put on, on their trachea and they can't breathe. So they, so they breathe through a smaller hole. So they, they start snoring and then get, and they, 
decrease the oxygen, increase the carbon dioxide, and they stop breathing. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been married to somebody who has this, you end up sleeping with your hand on their back, making sure in your sleep that they're still breathing all night. So and it's part very of you upset. Is not sleeping well. Right, you're not sleeping because you're you're in between snoring and snorting, and sometimes they even have uh, because of the carbon dioxide buildup. They even have nightmares hmm. and night terrors because they're hypoxic, and that makes your brain go kind of go a little bit crazy. So you wake up in in fear. So it makes sleep not very much fun. So is that why people use like uh, uh, CPAP? Mm -hmm. I was just say BiPAP, but it's CPAP. So so there's a couple things you can do if you have that. There's there's three things that can keep you awake at night that they can diagnose uh, with a sleep study. And sleep studies are getting easier and easier. They're they're doing them so you can do them in your, your own home. Oh wow! I did them to find out restless leg syndrome, but I have, but that goes along with ADD as well. So that's kind is that of a tied. neurological. Yeah, it's a neurologic, trend. but it, it's central. It's in your brain. It's yeah. not in your legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's tied into ADHD, but you can get it diagnosed by taking having a sleep study and seeing so, how many times you wake up because you're moving. So narcolepsy, ADHD, and restless leg are all all in the same in the genetic same area, okay. and and cross over how you um, how you show or how how you your body uh, has symptoms is dependent on many other things that impact that are using your genes as the basis. But but what you do can impact which symptom you end up with or if you end up with all of them. But this, the sleep apnea is also diagnosed at the same test. You can have it treated in two ways. One, you will need a CPAP machine, which you have to carry with you and use every night. And it, it requires a mask. It's or a it forced requires, air delivery. It blows forced, your throat open. Right. And so the minute you stop breathing, it breathes for you and, and keeps a lot of oxygen in there. And many people are relieved and feel so much better when they are using this. But some people know that they aren't going to be able to use a machine like this. And they have a very large glottis. That's that little punching bag that hangs down in the back of your throat. So some ENTs, not everyone, will shave the glottis because if you're lying like shave this, shave it like to narrow it, or shave it shave to it to make it shorter and smaller. Shorter. Yep. it's you still need it to prevent uh, choking on things. Right. But but it doesn't. They make it small enough so it doesn't fall back over your opening. Yeah. And that sometimes is part of the issue. Weight loss is another part of the issue. Sometimes if you lose 10 to 20 to 50 pounds, you don't have sleep apnea anymore because you don't have you don't have this choking if you lie on your back. Yeah. So this is not a simple subject. This is something multiple different doctors may have to look at. A yeah. neurologist is the doctor that does the sleep studies or a pulmonologist. They share this kind of a um, specialty. Yeah. So you go to a sleep center, and those are the types of doctors that are there that will talk to you about whether you have anything or whether you have nothing and you're sleeping for a different, not sleeping for a different reason. That usually ends up be coming to me. They, they come to me because then it's hormonal. And it's lack of melatonin, lack of testosterone, lack of estrogen, too much cortisol, and lack of MSH, which is melanin-stimulating melanin hormone. And it's also from the pituitary. So we start with the least severe, least disruptive interventions and our work, work our way up the food Which is behavioral. Until we get things solved. Right, behavioral. So, and then talk, talk to a doctor who's primary care. They're really good at this. Don't go to a doctor who just says, here, take this pain or sleep medicine. Right. That you isn't going to help no, you. I there's mean, there's something going on that needs to be addressed. And why would you treat? Why would you treat sleep when you know there's a source of the problem? Why would you treat it with just a pill? Except that it's easy. But you're not going to feel good when you wake up from taking a pill right. to go to sleep. Granted, you may need some specific medication, like clonazepam is a medication we use for restless legs for some people. Some people don't need it. Some people don't care if they have restless legs. So that I mean, you can wear. Um, what are the bands? Fitbit. Fitbit, and you can tell whether you wake up all night with yeah, with restless it'll, it'll legs. Yeah, it'll track your sleep cycles and your and your circadian not your circadian rhythm, but your brain waves, alpha, delta, theta. Yeah, so uh, it's it's going to interpret in, into that. Right. 
So, so there are many ways to do this, but you start with behavioral changes, like Brett gave us last time, last mm-hmm. week, and then you go to primary care doctors who will then sort this out, hopefully, and not just give you a pill. And then you may go to a sleep study. You may go to a hormone doctor and get your hormones replaced. Um, you may go to an ENT after you have your sleep study to, to have something done. Sometimes even cleaning out sinuses helps. Uh, if you need something that's surgical because you aren't going to be able to tolerate, for some reason, the mechanical breathing. So they may hand you a neti pot and a hypnosis tape. Yeah. So go try this. Right. I mean, there's a, there's an expert in, in sleep and relaxation breathing is, is um, Andrew Weil. And he has a tape, which I, I've told the story before that um, our, one of my friends who's a rehab physician says, here, you need to you need to listen to this. And I laughed so hard in his office because I said, this is the biggest crock I've ever heard of because he's teaching you how to breathe. I breathe every day. I breathe since I came out of my mother, <laughs> you know, and I listened to the tape and honestly, I was breathing wrong. Yeah. And that made me short of breath. And I was holding my breath when I ran up the stairs, when I was going to delivery. Right. So I was out of breath right. instead of right. breathing while you run. So there were many things that he taught me. So I think I, I think it's very important to make sure you're breathing properly. But he also teaches you that process of self-hypnosis and self-relaxation. And it's on a CD. You can listen to it whenever you Absolutely. want to. Absolutely. Not, so, not while you're driving in the car. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You cannot listen to that tape while you're driving because it makes you so relaxed. So relaxed. So as always, we say to you that being an informed consumer is one of your best assets for good health. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.